the Canterbury Tales, an enormous book which discusses what? Stories told by various pilgrims during a pilgrimage. Yes, the Canterbury Tales is a book which was written towards the end of the 14th century, that is medieval literary period. The poet, the writer of this book, the Canterbury Tales, is Geoffrey Chaucer, who was born around 1343, uh, in between 1343 or 1345 in London. He is called as the father of English literature and the father of English poetry. Yes, the genre of the Canterbury Tales is it is an estate satire. Now, what is an estate? See, Chaucer describes pilgrims from each of the three medieval estates. What are these three estates? The church, the people who prayed, nobility, the people who were chivalric, okay, and peasantry, the people who worked. So these were the three estates during the medieval period. So this is an estate satire. He describes people from these three estates with a certain mockery, calling it an estate satire. The setting of the Canterbury Tales is the pilgrimage to the shrine of Thomas Beckett in Canterbury. Who is the narrator? Narrator primarily is Chaucer. Why? See, although each pilgrim tells his or her own tale, that is story, but the entire frame narrative is told only through the eyes of Chaucer the pilgrim. Actually, originally, he did not even want to go on the pilgrimage. It was later that he decided, okay, I will also come. That's how he told the stories of all the pilgrims through his own eyes. Okay. Now, I mean, the stories were, I'm again saying, the stories are told by the pilgrims. But the entire frame narrative is through the eyes of the Chaucer, okay, of Chaucer, which makes him the narrator, clear narrator. The tale, a little bit about the Canterbury Tales before starting. See, middle and late 14th century was a tumultuous time in England, very disturbing time in England. Why? First, natural calamity, that is the bubonic plague pandemic. You can actually, you know, compare it with the time of COVID. Can you imagine it was just like that. So the bubonic plague pandemic wiped out millions of people between 1346 to 1353. Then groups such as low lords, they rebelled against the power of the church. Then peasant revolts such as the Jack Straw Rebellion of 1381 took place. Okay. This is like the peasant revolt, which was actually led by Jack Straw. Then a new middle class consisting of educated workers, which consisted of merchants, lawyers, clerks. They started to gain power, particularly in the urban areas. In fact, let me tell you, Chaucer himself was a member of this new middle class. So the Canterbury Tales is a vivid or a grand picture of these turbulent times in England. 30 pilgrims gather together at Tabard in, in South Walk. Most of the pilgrims are introduced by brief, vivid sketches in the general prologue. And who, you know, uh, who influenced Chaucer to write these tales? You should know. The Canterbury Tales was influenced by Boccaccio's Deca Merin, in which stories are told by 10 lords and ladies traveling around Florence as they try to escape the Black Plague. Right? Now, a little bit about the frame narrative. Canterbury Tales consists of first the general prologue, then followed by these tales. Please listen. Knight's Tale, Miller's Tale, Reeve's Tale, Cook's Tale, Man of Law's Tale, Wife of Bath's Tale, Friar's Tale, Summoner's Tale, Clerk's Tale, Merchant's Tale, Squire's Tale, Franklin's Tale, Second Nun's Tale, Canon Yeoman's Tale, Physician's Tale, Partner's Tale, Shipman's Tale, Prioress's Tale, Tale of Sir Topaz, Tale of Melibius, The Monk's Tale, Nun's Priest's Tale, Manciple's Tale, Parson's Tale. And it ends with Chaucer's retraction. In this video, I have selected the most important tales for you. Shall we begin? Don't worry, I have to bring more parts because I cannot justify Canterbury Tales only in one video. Okay, so this is literally the Canterbury Tales part one by Walat. Okay, let's begin with the general prologue. So the general prologue begins with Chaucer's description of spring. Chaucer introduces the pilgrims one by one, describing their physical appearance and apologizing from the readers if he is rude in his description. 
He says that all these pilgrims have gathered at the Tabard Inn to go on a religious pilgrimage. And why do men go on these pilgrimages? When they feel religious zeal and also when they feel physical desire. Okay, then Chaucer tells the readers that the host of the Tabard Inn, a man named Harry Belly. It is Harry Belly's idea that the pilgrims must engage in a telltale contest or a telltale competition to make the journey far from silence. These people will be walking towards Canterbury. They should not feel bored during this pilgrimage, so they should tell tales to each other. It will be like a competition in which who will be the judge? The host. Harry Belly will be the judge. He announces himself to be the judge of these tales and he says that everyone else will have to pay for the winner's dinner upon their arrival. I mean, upon their return, return to the inn. The pilgrims agree happily, but now who will start with the first tale? For that, they draw straws. It's like a lucky draw to see who will tell the first tale. And it is the knight who is the first. Knight is the most noble person in the company and he is telling the first tale. And in fact, Chaucer describes Knight, Knight very nicely, very gently, okay, about his chivalric deeds, about his manners. Okay, so let's begin with the Knight's tale. The Knight is a proficient storyteller. He uses rhetoric in his tale. Let's listen to his tale. While Theseus, the founder of Athens, is bringing his wife Hippolyta back to Athens, they encounter weeping noble women on the way. Hippolyta's sister, Emily, is also accompanying them. So who all are returning to Athens? It is Theseus, his wife Hippolyta, and Hippolyta's sister, Emily. Easy? Now, Theseus fights the evil tyrant Creon from Thebes to avenge these, you know, noble women. Okay. After winning, Theseus finds two cousin knights. They are badly injured, but they are not dead. What are the names of these knights? Arcite and Palamon. They are badly wounded, but alive. Theseus takes Arcite and Palamon to Athens and imprisons them in dungeon for life. But in Athens, love happens. How? Palamon falls head over heels in love with Emily as he spies on her from his prison window all the time in the morning. She's coming, walking in the garden and Palamon cannot stop looking at this beauty, Emily. But the same happens with our sight. Oh God, the two cousins have fallen in love with the same woman. Now, they had sworn chivalry for life and also that they will never fight over a lady but this is precisely what happens. The two cousins, Palamon and Arcite, fight for Emily. When Theseus releases Arcite on the condition that he never returns to Athens, he's sad. Theseus would, you know, uh, Arcite literally will miss looking at the beautiful Emily. So what does Arcite the knight do? He disguises him, himself to take a position in Theseus' court. So he returns to Athens in disguise. Meanwhile, Palamon drugs the jailer and he also escapes the prison. So now both the knights are out in the open and they begin a duel for Emily. But wait, Theseus says, that's not how you will fight in my kingdom, my kingdom, my rules. Go back, wait for one year, gather a big army, come back. I will build a big arena for you. Then you fight a magnificent fight. Whoever will win that battle will win the hand of Emily, my sister-in-law. <laughs> now, Palamon prays to Venus, who is the goddess of love. Arcite prays to Mars, who is the god of war for victory. Here the theme is competition. Emily prays to Diana for either chastity or the love of the man who truly desires her. One year passes Big army, grand armies are collected. Palamon and Arcite return to Athens and the battle in the huge arena begins. What is the result of this battle? Arcite is victorious, but just then a fury from hell pops up and scares his horse so much that Arcite is literally thrown off from his horse. Arcite is down from the horse. He's almost dead. He's dying, lethally injured. Arcite asks for forgiveness from his cousin, Palamon Knight, and says that Palamon can have Emily. Theseus moralizes that, you know, our wish is no wish in front of God. All mortals should submit to the wisdom and will of the gods. After this, Palamon and Emily marry, that is, they wed and they live happily ever after. With this, the night's tale is over.
How did you like it? This was Night's Tale about Palamon and Arcite. Now, after this, which other important tale? Remember, these pilgrims are going towards pilgrimage to Canterbury. They are telling the tales on the way. It is a competition. The knight has told his tale. The next tale I will discuss is the Miller's Tale. As I told you, many tales will have their own prologue and epilogue. So Miller's Tale will have a prologue. Listen, Miller is drunk. He's not the second to tell the story, but he demands that he should in order to quiet the night. What is the meaning of quiet? To answer back, to give an answer. Listen to Miller's lines. By armies and by blood and bones, I can a noble tale for the nuns with which I will now quiet the night's tale. Knight used absolutely beautiful words, chivalric words in his tale, but Miller's tale is going to be full of double meaning, okay? So kindly beware. Miller tells a fabulu. Fabulu is a bodily humorous tale which is filled with dirty jokes. But before that, Chaucer, the narrator, warns the readers, that is us, that if we don't want to read a risk tale or a sexually, you know, suggestive tale, we should turn the page over, that is, turn over the leaf and choose another tale or chase another tale. This is medieval English right in front of you, whatever I've written in italics, okay? Now, listen, the tale of the miller. A carpenter lives with his wife, Alison. Carpenter is old and foolish, whereas Alison, his wife, is young and vivacious. Carpenter is devoted towards Alison. Just then, a smart and young scholar from Oxford named Nicholas enters. Oh, Nicholas really likes Alison and Nicholas succeeds in wooing Alison because she's no less. OK, the two plan to sleep together. OK, Alison, the wife of the carpenter and Nicholas. But there is another man here whose name is Absolon. Absolon is a clerk. He also likes Alison. He tries to woo Alison, but Alison rejects him. Now, how will Nicholas and Alison sleep together under the nose of the carpenter? Listen, Nicholas pretends that a flood twice the size of Noah's flood is approaching the town and it will drown everybody. So to save themselves, the three should sleep in tubs. But the reality is that Alison and Nicholas, they want to be intimate under the carpenter's nose at night. Absolon comes to Alison's window. Absolon, the clerk, remember, because he wants to get a kiss from her. But in anger, Alison sticks her rare end to his face. It's so bad. <laughs> Canterbury Tales is cheap. Absolon is angry. In anger, he goes, borrows a red hot poker from the blacksmith. When he returns with this hot poker, Nicholas farts in his face. In whose face? Absolon's face. But Absolon takes his revenge by smashing poker on Nicholas's buttocks. Oh God, Nicholas feels so hot. He shouts for water, which wakes the carpenter up. And remember, they were sleeping on tubs, like high tubs. The tub literally crashes to the ground. Carpenter falls on the ground. The tale ends with everyone laughing at the miserable cuckolded carpenter. <laughs> We're done with the miller's tale after this. The pilgrims are moving. They are shocked with this language that the miller used. And then the reeve. The reeve is a local official in Anglo-Saxon England. He's a carpenter by craft. Because the miller spoke about a carpenter, the reeve feels insulted because he's a carpenter. Okay. So the reeve gets insulted listening to miller's fablu. Reeve declares he will start his tale to quiet the millers. Listen to the lines from the book. So thick. Full well code I D quit. I really don't know how to say this with blaring of proud millerous yeah. Please pardon me if I have said these words wrong. I'm really not an expert in medieval English. Okay, whatever. Reeve says that now I will quiet the, you know, Miller because he spoke so bad about carpenters. Reeve's tale is also a fablu on silly millers. Okay, a fablu on silly millers. Listen to Reeve's tale. Simkin is a scoundrel miller with a fat pug nose. Pug nose literally means a short nose with an upturned tip. Two young scholars, Alan and John, they have come to the miller to grind their grain, but they try hard to stop the miller from stealing, okay? Simkin, the miller, devises a plan. 
He releases the scholar's horse into a field of wild mares. The scholars spend all day chasing their horse, which gives the miller, you know, plenty of time to steal grain. At night, these scholars, that is Alan and John, they sleep at Miller's tiny house where who all are sleeping, listen, the miller, his wife, their young daughter, their infant, they all share this tiny room with the two scholars. Now the scholars are revengeful. They know that they have been cheated by the miller. So how will they take revenge? By sleeping with the women of the house. To take his revenge on the miller, first, what does Alan do? Alan sleeps with miller's daughter. And then what does John do? John switches the cradle of the infant from the foot of Miller's bed to the foot of his bed. Mistaking the beds, the Miller's wife hops into the bed with John and sleeps with her. Can you imagine? After making love, Alan crawls back into the bed, but it is the Miller who is sleeping next to him. It is not John. He brags about his act to the Miller mistaking him to be John. Chaos erupts, everybody wakes up, everybody beats up the miller. And with this, we are done with the Reeves tale. Now let me talk about the next tale told by the wife of Bath. As I told you, I am telling you the important tales right now. Don't worry, I am going to bring the Canterbury Tales in part two also. We'll have enough time to speak about the characteristics of all these pilgrims. It will happen. Okay, listen to these tales right now because they are really important. The Wife of Bath's Prologue and Trail. First, Prologue. The Wife of Bath begins her tale with a long prologue, which is a literary confession or a monologue in which she talks unhesitatingly about her virtues and faults. What are her virtues and faults? Let's listen. The Wife of Bath says that her authority to tell her tale comes from experience. She has had five husbands, which makes her an expert in the realm of marriage and relationship between men and women. In fact, she also provides her own interpretations of biblical allusions. She literally changes facts in history. Can you imagine? The wife of Bath does it. Now, wife of Bath tells about how, you know, wives control their husbands. And this makes the pardoner, who is one of the pilgrims, very nervous because pardoner is about to get married. <laughs> He's like, oh God, are girls like this? Will my uh, going to be wife also control me? Now, the wife of Bath describes all her five relations with her five husbands. How? The first three husbands were rich old men. They were good, but boring. They were like putty in the palms of her hands. She could shape them the way she wanted. The fourth husband had affairs outside marriage. All the wife of Bath herself was a lustful woman, but she made sure to make his life a living hell. Whose life? The fourth husband's. Now let's talk about the fifth husband. Jankin, wife of Bath's fifth husband, is smart but poor. He irritates her often by reading a book about wicked wives. One day out of anger, the wife of Bath tears the pages of this book, which is about wicked wives, and he punches Jankin, the fifth husband, in the face. But surprisingly, Jankin hits her back. Yes, it is like equal. The wife of Bath pretends to be dead for some time after getting a blow due to which Jankin feels guilty. And he accepts all her whims and fancies from then onwards. But let me tell you, due to this hitting, the wife of Bath has got deaf in one ear. Because of, you know, such a kind of intensity and, uh, oh God, revelation, the friar and the summoner, they literally interrupt the wife of Bath. Friar hates what the wife of Bath is saying. Summoner hates because friar is disturbing. So literally a chaos erupts. Wife of Bath cannot continue. The host intervenes. He quiets the friar and the summoner. And he tells the wife of Bath to begin with her tale now. Stop talking about your husbands. Tell us your tale. So we start with the wife of Bath's tale. During the days of King Arthur, fairies roamed around England and not friars. At that time, a young lustful knight rapes a maid. Surprisingly, the queen gets ready to pardon the knight if he can find out what women want. So the queen wants this knight to find out what women want. The quest of the knight begins. He roams around the countryside interviewing women on their views of what they exactly want. Different women give different answers. Finally, an old woman says she knows the answer, but she would utter it only if the knight promises to pledge his life to her. 
she wants her you know uh, her say to be done knight agrees knight is like okay if you give me the answer i will accept whatever you say so with the help of this old lady the knight returns to the court and tells the queen the answer what is the answer to what women want quote the women want sovereignty over their husbands every woman in the court agrees to his answer and the knight is set free after this the old woman forces the knight to marry her remember she said that whatever i will say you have to do it so she forces him to marry her he does it out of no choice and after marriage the old woman offers knight a choice what is the choice either she can remain ugly and faithful or she can turn beautiful and unfaithful to this the knight lets the old woman choose as you decide oh to this answer the old lady transforms herself into beautiful yet faithful woman did you understand the moral of the story the women want sovereignty over their husbands if you tell them you decide you whatever you say if you become their yes man yes man then they will give you everything positive she became beautiful and also faithful <laughs> with this we are done with the wife of bath's tale next for today this is all did you like it i loved it i will continue the canterbury tales in my next next video kindly return this is heena from team walat it was lovely being with you take care of yourself bye bye